I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Francisco J. Santiago Avila. Um, Fran is an interdisciplinary researcher advocate with over a decade's experience in conservation and animal science, ethics, and policy issues. He is the Big River Connectivity Science and Conservation Manager for Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute, where he helps promote compassion and respect for wild carnivores and nature, their protection, and the renaturalization of the Mississippi River watershed. His work explores the application of nature ethics to our mixed community of humans, animals, and nature with a focus on the promotion of worldviews rooted in an ethic of care and justice towards non-humans and the reverence for life. He's a graduate of the University of Puerto Rico, Rios Piedras, got his master's at Duke University and his PhD in environment and resources from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Very impressive human. He has worked on a variety of environmental and conservation issues from state wildlife management to national and international impact assessments. His most recent work evaluating the use of lethal methods for wolf control in Michigan suggests that killing wolves is not effective at reducing the risk of attacks on domestic ungulates, cows, and sheep, and increases the risk of conflicts in adjacent properties. Fran's qualitative research interests and advocacy work focus on the promotion of ethical deliberation to equitably consider animals and policy and the exploration of conservation ethics that promote the flourishing of our entire community of life. He recently published an ethical examination of the laws and regulations governing gray wolf management in the state of Wisconsin, concluding that current management is blatantly dismissive of the interest of wolves and thus provides inadequate oversight for ethical interspecies coexistence. And this dismissal is pervasive in human wildlife issues globally. Fran is a founding member of PanWorks, a not-for-profit think tank dedicated to cultivating compassion, respect, and justice for animals. Fran, thank you so much for being here today, and I'll go ahead and let you take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Rosie. That was so kind of you. I am going to quickly share my screen before I do anything else. Let's see if I can get this going. There we go. I hope hopefully everyone can see that. We can see it, Fran. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks so much, Rosie, again. Uh, thanks to Corrine and Steph as well for the beautiful poem. Uh, good day, buenos dias a todos. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with everyone. It's so exciting to be here presenting. Um, this was kind of one of my, you know, sort of um, goals when I started studying uh, and advocating for wolves was to actually participate in this kind of uh, conference and dialogue. So I'm very humbled by the invitation and the opportunity. So I'll start by noting that I'm presenting to all of you from Madison, Wisconsin, and I'll start by acknowledging that this is ancestral Ho-Chunk Ho -Chunk land. And so acknowledge the sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk and all indigenous peoples everywhere. Um, so throughout my talk today, I'm gonna to touch on topics that are of course relevant to wolves, but also to our relationships to the non-human world more generally. And my intent is to highlight why truly caring for and respecting wolves implies much more than concerns about, for example, the sustainability of wolf populations. So I'm going to propose that caring for and respecting wolves should be focusing on the feeling, the thinking, the aware, the social being that each wolf is. And my explore, exploration of this is gonna focus on denouncing and opposing those paradigms that dismiss wolves and other animals. So I'm gonna illustrate this with, of course, some examples. Um, sorry about that. And I'm gonna conclude by arguing that a stance against both anthrop anthropocentrism and human sovereignty over animals is indispensable if we strive to respect and speak for wolves as well as all animals. So let's get started. Whoops. Some issues here. Okay. 
So I'm a transdisciplinary researcher, as Rosie mentioned, and I publish a number of scientific articles, empirical articles evaluating, for example, how wolves from different populations experience periods of lower protections. And real briefly here, we've consistently found that lowering protections for wolves doesn't increase tolerance at all, but rather increases the rate of wolves being killed both legally and illegally, more, most prominently. I've also researched the impact of lethal and non-lethal interventions on wolves and domestic animals. And uh, we found there, you know, science has found that lethal methods are highly variable in their effectiveness. They are often also ineffective and counterproductive. Plus, they can increase the risk of predation at adjacent sites. But although this and a lot of other research, of course, have informed my views on wolf-human coexistence, and what's necessary to tackle there. In my opinion, what needs more emphasis uh, is something conservationists are not very comfortable with, and that is emphasizing wolves themselves as individuals, their well-being, and their claims. Now, while I was engaged uh, in my research during my PhD, I also started looking into that question of, well, what about the wolves? Who's speaking for them really in all this policy debate? And that led me to study ethics, uh, of course, environmental ethics, but also animal ethics, you know, eco-feminist nature ethics, concepts like compassion and justice. And in that way, and in that exploration, gray wolves ultimately became a catalyst for a shift in my worldview that covered everything from science to ethics and landed me on a worldview that compels me to begin relating to the entire world from an ethic of care and an ethic of multi-species justice, which I will explain. Now, before we get into that, I'll explain that what I'm talking about here is a worldview, what philosophers often call a metaphysics, which is basically the way you holistically see the whole universe, yourself, and your place in it, and other beings in it as well. So asking and responding to that question, who are wolves and who is speaking for them, had a profound effect on my worldview. Wolves, in that way, taught me about the, import the importance of foregrounding others, including animals, uh, which means striving for compassionate, respectful relationships with non-human lives. So basically through wolves, I first realized or came to the you know, actual conscious uh, awareness that we all have a well-being, that we all are vulnerable and can be harmed, that we all have a will to live and are mortal, and that we all hold valuable relationships that sustain us. And wolves and other animals are no exception. So let's start that exploration by uh, beginning with uh, some, some information on predators in the U.S. Now, um, most folks here might know that not only wolves, but predators in general were persecuted in the U.S. with intent to exterminate until around the middle of the last century because uh, they were seen as both harming human interest and lacking instrumental value for humans, which is what's important. Now, of course, there was no recognition that predators also value their own lives and well-being that are important to them. And this was and still is the case with wolves and most non-human animals in, in practice. In fact, it is still the case within much of the discipline of conservation itself globally. Way too much, in my opinion, and we'll get a little bit into that as well. Well, before we get into that, this perspective uh, of, instrumental, of instrumentalizing wildlife within um, wildlife management in the US was pretty much institutionalized within uh, government agencies, th thanks in large part to the co-opting of the discipline of the, of the um, American public by this instrumental wise use of nature paradigm of um, President Theodore Roosevelt and his friend and uh, first chief of the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, around the early 1900s. And uh, importantly, they also advanced scientific technocratic wildlife management. But, and this is critical to understand, they were loyal always to that instrumental value paradigm within wildlife management. Now an instrumental value paradigm means that non-human lives and communities are only valuable for what they can provide to and for humans. 
Uh, we can otherwise ignore that these other lives have value in themselves and have their own well-being and their own claims. But then, you know, things started changing uh, and Western scientists around last century began to reveal what, of course, First Nations have known for centuries, that predators play important ecological roles that benefit the community of life. And then the public began to argue for their ecological value and protection as well. And in response to that shift in mindset, public agencies began to accommodate those concerns. So you have a new paradigm in carnivore conservation that was institutionalized around the 1960s and 70s, in which there's no more intent to exterminate, but populations would be managed sustainably. Sustainably, but always with negative impacts on human interests being mitigated to the extent possible, including by lethal means. And that's pretty much the official stance of federal and state agencies, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, excluding, of course, you know, various states in the Rockies that are seemingly still aiming to exterminate wolves through these same historic policies. So this kind of dismissal um, is why I argue that despite a focus by pretty much all parties of this debate in wolf and wildlife, uh, of wolf and wildlife policy on the science side of things, the most important dimensions here are clearly and unavoidably ethical. So that we need to begin by questioning not the science itself, but the worldviews, the values, the objectives that motivate that science. You know, because, you know, and, and this is important to, to highlight, worldviews and ethics still decide what questions science is going to ask. They still decide what, what science is going to consider and take into account in a lot of ways. You know, and I'll give you a clear example. In uh, wolf policy, the focus is always on a particular kind of science, you know, and very, very tiny sliver of science, which is namely that centered around human interests. You know, a few examples here, the sustainability of wolf populations, you know, the effectiveness of conflict mitigation for the livestock industry, uh, concerns over hunting opportunities for hunters. All of these are human interests. So bringing the point home that science is a tool. And just like any tool, it's going to depend on what you use it for, namely the questions here, the questions that you ask of it. And so today, to improve not only our relationships to wolves, but to all non-human beings, our conversations about animals need to go beyond this tiny sliver of science, you know, beyond population science and the human benefits to have a frank conversation about our relationship with wolves and other animals as vulnerable beings with their own claims. Oh. And, um, Another point here, right, is that we shouldn't assume that advocates, wolf advocates, really understand this. You know, as with a lot of other issues involving animals, wolf advocates fall generally on a spectrum of mostly ambivalent, relativistic, almost ethical perspectives towards individual animals, including wolves. And I'm going to propose through our exploration two interrelated components to that ambivalence and which results a lot of the time in dismissal of animals and their claims. One component is going to be anthropocentrism and the other component is going to be human sovereignty. So let's start with anthropocentrism. So in many ways, conservation still remains committed to that same new sustainability paradigm that's focused on benefits to humans that co-opted the field at the beginning of last and throughout the last century. And that dismissal, in fact, has made its way to environmental ethics as well. And I'm going to give you some examples. In the seminal article, What is Conservation Biology by Michael Soleil, he promotes the view that conservationists shouldn't concern the, themselves with the suffering of individual animals when it comes to conservation issues. And environmental ethicists have also largely dismissed the value of individual non-human lives when it comes to conservation interventions, almost as functional units of what's really important and what's really of value for them, which are the, the aggregates, the populations, the species, the, the communities or ecosystems. So that dismissal of individuals 
is a big part of the motivation for the growing fields of convention conservation and for calls for multi-species justice within conservation. Now, what never gets highlighted is that that dismissal of others' lives and claims, in that case animals, rests on a prejudice against others who are different in some ways we think of as less valuable, despite sharing in a lot more fundamental traits and claims to well-being and life. So looking at it from that perspective, we prejudice against animals using the same logic as those who prejudice against other humans. And that means that the ethical worldviews that are currently dominating conservation are rooted in a human exceptionalism that's based on an ideal of the human that dismisses not only animal life, but other non-humans as well. Now, some folks are going to think that this is an issue of speciesism, you know, of privileging the human species rather than an ideal of the human. But this is where the insights of philosopher Matthew Calarco are particularly important. And he suggests that, and I quote, the dominant trends in our culture have never been towards respect for the species as a whole, for the human species as a whole, but rather for what is considered to be quintessentially human, end quote. So that the problem resides in, and I quote again, the privileging of that class of beings who best fulfill a conception of what is considered to be quintessentially human over and against all others, end quote. So what does this mean? That means that those who deviate from the paradigmatic ideal of the human are discriminated against. And in Western culture, historically, that ideal of the human has been identified as an independent, rational man who is able-bodied and white, usually also heterosexual and carnist, they meet. So that everyone else that doesn't, to some extent, fulfill those ideals is discriminated against in some way. And that is the institutionalized underlying paradigm within traditional conservation, including public agencies. Now, notice, you know, um, how management agencies and management, management plans, management policies never start with who wolves are or any non-humans are, basically. They don't consider their claims alongside those of humans and ecological wholes, despite all the scientific evidence of wolves having rich internal and social lives. So this is also, all this evidence is scientific evidence. All this evidence is also best available science from neuroscience, from animal behavior, from comparative and evolutionary psychology. But, you know, despite that, and despite all the discourse on best available science, you never see it in management plans, given its ethical implications, of course. And it doesn't also get highlighted on these arguments promoting the use of best available science and policy. So... Basically, we know that as with humans, wolves value their lives and others that are, they're related with, that they are vulnerable again to many types of harm, physical, mental, social harm that they would rather avoid, and that they are embedded in deep relationships with others that sustain them. And that should lead us to consider them as more than just resources to be used sustainable. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of how this plays out, a little bit more examples of how this plays out in wolf policy. So despite all these fundamental shared ethical claims to life and well-being, the claims of wolves and largely other predators are dismissed in wildlife management. And an example here, you know, we, um, in 2018, we published an analysis, an ethical examination of the laws and regulations governing gray wolf management in Wisconsin that uh, I did during my PhD with uh, my advisor and uh, another mentor, William Lynn and Adrian Trevis. And generally we found that the agencies, you know, both federal and state involved in Wisconsin wolf management, their missions, their values, their actions were explicitly anthropocentric to the extent, you know, that the urgent interest of even ecological wholes like the population or the species beyond, beyond what is relevant for human benefits are not considered. And of course, the lack of consideration is even starker for individual non-human animals, which are, are completely dismissed. 
Now, additionally, as part of my work with Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute, we recently had to review and provide guidance for folks and submit public comments on the two recent drafts of this, that the states of uh, Michigan and Minnesota put out uh, recently, like uh, a couple of months ago. And not to mention what's in the Colorado and Montana draft regulations that were recently published. And generally, we found that the same is true of all plants, that there is absolutely no recognition of wolf claims, even at the level of population. An example here, social stability right, is a good example because social stability of, of wolves in wolves is integral to population health and to mitigation of human wildlife conflicts. And yet the signs on how detrimental hunting is for population health, for individual mental health, even for conflicts, is never included in these regulations, despite all the available research out there. So what does this mean? That this means clearly that the well-being of wolves doesn't really matter if some humans, you know, generally in these discussions, mostly white, older, and male, are satisfied. And that is part of why killing for recreation is allowed and even promoted by government agencies. Now, how does this play out? We're talking about anthropocentrism, not only singling out animals, but other humans that don't fulfill that, that ideal. How does it play out for some of these humans, right? First off, right, when it comes to wolves and First Nations, advocates for wolf hunting in Wisconsin wolf management frequently and explicitly called for violating Ojibwe usufruct treaty rights and deny them wolf permits because the state wanted to kill more wolves. And the Ojibwe wanted to claim those permits to reduce the number of wolves that could be hunted. And in fact, the state actually repeatedly denied the Ojibwe such rights. Uh, additionally, more recently, uh, both the Trump and Biden administrations neglected to consult with tribes before removing and the New Species Act protections for wolves, despite again full knowledge of the cultural impact of policies allowing the widespread killing of their relatives, of individuals they had singled out as their relatives. And these ethical sensibilities of tribes towards wolves, which again, many tribes consider persons, are instrumentalized as well in some of these management plans as spiritual benefits that tribes would be able to enjoy despite states allowing and promoting the killing of their relatives through these hunts. Right? So dismissal of not only wolves, but humans there. In addition to that, we also hear many examples of the dismissal of just more considered views towards animals in general as either spiritual, emotional, or even ethical, as if that would be an argument. And in fact, some conservationists, you know, scientists, advocates as well, won't even engage with or promote ethical arguments sometimes, as opposed to purely scientific ones for protecting wildlife, which again speaks to the confusion over what science really does and where the fundam fundamental issues really are. So we see that this worldview not only dismisses and harms wolves, but all animals and many, if not most humans. And the point here is that in many ways, it's all the same fight. You know, from a perspective of worldviews, all these prejudices are constituted simultaneously in opposition to a particular ideal of the human. And not only for that, but to preserve the privilege of those sharing in those qualities and to promote the oppression and the dismissal of all those who don't, both humans and animals. Now, alongside that understanding of what an, an anthropocentric paradigm actually is and does, is this other issue that I mentioned of human sovereignty over animals, that it's related but not quite coextensive with it. So the, our focus uh, on uh, human sovereignty over animals in our work comes and it, it emanates from Australian political theorist Dinesh Waterwell, who understands sovereignty as a mode of human domination over animals that argues that liberal ethics has been constructed after, and argues that liberal ethics have been constructed after sovereignty. So here 
he mentions, you know, and this is important to highlight that he's talking about liberal ethics. He's not talking about conservative ethics or major uh, prejudices against um, other humans. I will explain why. And I added a, a quote there from Achilles Mbembe, where he explains sovereignty, but stating that, and I quote, sovereignty means the capacity to define who matters and who does not, who is disposable and who is not. So again, that's what sovereignty is. And what it will argues that that in the case of animals, that human domination has been constructed after sovereignty or, or ethics for animals. And Waterwell regards this as a problem because ethics that are constructed after sovereignty work only to regulate, and I quote, work only to regulate or mitigate the violent effects of that sovereignty while leaving the basic structure of domination intact, end quote. And that, he mentions, where that lands us is welfare. And welfare for him could be understood as this ethical action that is constrained by my wish to continue to exploit in some way. So Waterwolf says, and I'm going to quote again because it's an excellent quote, we offer welfare to those we have dominion over and wish to continue to dominate for our own benefit, but have the freedom to provide forms of limited consideration that do not temper our dominion rights, end quote. Ah, super powerful stuff. Now, a friend and I have, recent, have a recent publication that I added there, Conservation After Sovereignty, that of course makes the case that con conservation has been constructed after human sovereignty. And this is so because the paradigm under which conservation operates assumes that killing animals, um, first that we have the right to decide who lives and who dies, and second, that killing animals is not regarded as a violation of animals' right to life because that legitimacy to kill flows from our human right to decide. Because I quote, we believe ourselves to be and our violence to be superior, to be necessary for human fulfillment or to be giving other entities their due and, their, and therefore justifiable, end quote. Now, that implies that human sovereignty over animals doesn't occur only at the physical level of violence. It doesn't really even start there, but that the dismissal and the instrumentalization itself is violence. For example, the fact that what's important about wolves for many is always humans can enjoy them rather than wolves and their claims in their own right. And that's generally what these wolf plants promote. Now, Waterwall and ourselves, me and uh, Pablo Perez Castillo, my friend and co-author, also agree with post-colonial scholar Manisha Deca, who argues that, quoting again, at a foundational level, we can see that Western ideas of man's dominion over animals reflect a deeply gendered and imperial understanding of human relationships with animals, end quote. So in our view, humans' relationships to animals and nature need to change from a position of dominion and self-proclaimed right to decide over others to a position of cohabitation and respect among equal earthlings. And I would also argue uh, against some environmental ethicists that that's what Aldo Leopold meant by urging us to become citizens rather than tyrants of the land community. And this is a case also made by uh, environmental philosopher Robert, Robert Tamelstein, uh, which you should check out. So that we have the right to kill others should be questioned first and foremost. And we should encourage that deliberation for all acts that involve that rather than just fall back on this relativism towards harm to animals. Now, uh, many other scholars, you know, notably many ecofeminists, uh, many critical race theorists have shown how these oppressions against animals and other humans, like sexism, naturism, speciesism, white supremacy, racism, uh, ableism, among others, constitute one another. And I'll give you an example here. Philosopher Af Co in uh, her book, uh, Afroisms, which I've um, added right there, says, and I quote, 
white supremacy is composed of anti-animal sentiments. Hence, in order to take down this ideology, our activism must include a robust analysis of animals within the racial landscape, end quote. And I'll add to that that critical race theorist uh, Claire Jean Kim argues that, and I quote again, racism and animalness are dynamically interconstituted, end quote. So, so taking all this into account, right, as an alternative worldview to this, I like to affirm an intersectional ethics of care, inspired also in ecofeminist -fem work, also bioethics and disability studies. And an ethic of care is based on recognizing and respecting others' differences and vulnerabilities without devaluing those differences or assuming a right to decide for those individuals that are different. So an ethic of care requires that we listen to animals instead of to what other humans are telling us about them, as ecofeminist Carol Adams and Josephine Donovan state, and recognize that each animal is irreplaceably different, just as we consider uh, humans. So an ethic that listens to animals understands that animals are not the conceptual animal. We're not talking here about the wolf but rather real living individuals, wolves. So it strives for an effective, respectful relationality that doesn't really think of animals as isolated individuals, but rather as beings in relationships who depend on one another, both as individuals and communities. Now, I'll note here that I am talking and I'm highlighting a relational and experiential, a social kinship, rather than an evolutionary or biotic one that some environmental philosophers like to highlight. And this kinship that I'm, this relational experiential kinship is a kinship that values embodied vulnerability and dependency. And this is also emphasized a lot by disability studies. And so ecofeminists like Sonara Taylor and her book, Peace of Burdens, that I've added so this for me means that all wolves should be valued as relational beings and importantly, also as autonomous individuals and political agents. So that their claims to well-being and life should be explicitly considered in all policies that affect them. And the same is gonna go for, of course, any animal, domestic, feral, wild, predator, prey, you name it. Now, I'll note that in my scholarly work, I tie that ethics of care with multi-species justice. And I do so through the concepts of respect and dignity, which I've added there. Why? Because an ethic of care acknowledges the dignity of otherness and differences. Dignity meaning that those different others are worthy of respect just as they currently are. And respect means that we have due regard, you know, substitute for that, adequate consideration for the claims of those different individuals. Now, respect and dignity are also intimately tied to justice because justice concerns what we owe to and are owed to by others in our communities. It is generally associated with fairness and other animals have always had claims to fairness and have always also been part of those communities those mixed communities, as Mary Midgley calls them. So justice can and ought to apply to our relationship with non-human beings. And we should reckon with that realization because it demands that we give up comforts derived from animal oppression. Now, what would that look like if we decided to do that? So um, during my research, PhD research, and I was sort of like doing this empirical stuff and at the same time exploring all this ethical stuff, I realized, when I realized that wolves were a different type of self, I also realized that the same was true of cows and chickens and elk and deer and mice and fishes and spiders, et cetera. Right? So this for me meant that my advocacy for wolves needed to go beyond these instrumental concerns over population numbers, 
wants or our human wants to either hear them or feel them near or know they're out there to advocacy for the well-being of wolves themselves within the policy process. Now, in practice, that would, of course, preclude all wolf hunting and trapping, basically, but it would also set a higher standard of ethical and scientific justification for any harm, including even targeted harmful interventions, especially when there are so many effective, non-lethal, non-harmful alternatives that are available and that are feasible, right? But we also don't need to stop at wolf-specific plans or issues because, again, this is a worldview that includes all animals. So wolf plans, for me, become a symptom of this larger view that's dismissive of animals and a lot of these uh, um, issues intersect with one another. So how can we intersect um, uh, our advocacy for animals as well if these issues intersect? Now, how do these issues intersect, first of all? The clearest example of this dismissal of animals may be how most animal agriculture plainly dismisses animals. You know, both through bodily violation, restriction, psychological harm. And also it is the industry that along with hunters, a lot of the time spearheads the promotion of killing and displacing wildlife. And this is, of course, not limited to wolves. It includes all types of predators and includes raptors. Sometimes it includes species like prairie dogs, even horses and burros uh, that are being displaced. And this happens all the while this industry creates massive ecological harms that disproportionately impact not only animals again, but also the health, the livelihoods of the most marginalized and vulnerable human communities through environmental degradation, pollution of the air, water, soil, you name it. Additionally, this harm, all this harm is undertaken for products that are massively inefficient in terms of what they contribute to our nutrition, our caloric intake, and even have adverse effects on individuals and the climate. Uh, through green greenhouse gas emissions. So effectively, this is a blatant, massively harmful and unjust practice that is subsidized by many, by most, maybe most wolf advocates as well. And it promotes massive violence towards wolves and towards other uh, wild lives and domestic lives that are just as valuable as wolves intrinsically. So question that we need to ask ourselves here is why will, would wolves and wolf hunting matter and not this much more widespread exploitation of cows, sheep, pigs and chickens, etc., along with its impact on the millions of wild lives that are harmed and lost in the process, right? So I would argue that ethical consistency here is key for us to effectively promote values like dignity and respecting differences rather than promoting instead what is gonna be seen as the human wants of specific groups, which is going to be perceived as selfish and it doesn't really inspire engagement from others that are distant to the issue. And then there's the issue of hunting and trapping, you know, even hounding sometimes, which clearly go issues that go beyond wolves as well. No example here, is uh, issues like wildlife killing contests and trapping, which should of course be banned if we respect animals because we know that these activities are motivated by trivial claims to recreation and, you know, and rooted in dismissal of other beings. Um, I also imagine folks here would be against killing wolves, right? But wild ungulates like deer and fishes are not, di not different from wolves in their claims to life and well-being. So these practices should also, to an extent, continue to be questioned to the extent that human interests in them rely mainly on enjoyment or pleasure rather than actual subsistence need. So this means that while the reigning, perhaps clean plate, wise use, welfareist ethic would argue for simply not wasting the body of a being that is killed while retaining the right to kill that being, an anthropocentric anti-human sovereignty stance would begin by questioning your, your claim against that other being's claim to life and your right also to kill that being. The point being that there should be a strong presumption always against harm and the taking of life. And especially in societies like ours that have accessible alternatives to that, kill that killing 
even for subsistence purposes. Now, that said about hunting and all those practices, it also needs to be stated that criticizing a minority practice, like these generally are, or like killing contests, hunting, trapping, while partaking of much more egregious animal exploitation by, for example, subsidizing animal agriculture, seems more like an attempt to legitimize our inconsistent ethics and exert power over minorities and their practices. And this has happened before with other practices like cockfighting and dogfighting, which even though it is great that they're not there anymore, there are bigger issues that are not being addressed. And many times advocates of ending these contests are, are um, motivated by moral imperialism. I exert to exert that power over minorities and their practices. So again, to avoid that moral imperialism, we need first to be consistent. And we begin that process by taking a step back and questioning that self-proclaimed right to harm every single time. So closing here, right? They're speaking for what I want for, from wolves and then they're speaking for wolves and animals. There's been generally a focus on speaking for what I want from wolves that has been confused for speaking for wolves. And that mistake is dangerous for all wolves and animals because it substitutes our claim for theirs while still making us believe that we are being just and respectful to them when we're not. Uh, so to speak for wolves, we need to recognize the dignity of differences and we need to approach our relations to them and all animals from an anti-anthropocentric, anti-human sovereignty worldview so that we recognize them, we listen to them, and we don't just assume a right to decide over their lives. Now, that also means leading with discussions on worldviews, values, and ethics instead of generally liberal calls for science-based management that retain that anthropocentrism and that retain that human sovereignty. It also means supporting individuals and organizations that represent those ethical perspectives within wildlife management and policy. And I'd like to end by you know, highlighting and um, asking folks to keep in mind that these perspectives I've presented here uphold values and uh, ethical principles that are shared globally. And many of the arguments I made here for animals and humans are what have led our species to this consensus that we have on how we should relate towards other humans. And it can likewise lead us towards respecting otherness and respecting animals and towards justice for not only wolves, but all animals. So I want to thank everyone for listening and for your advocacy. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions. I think we do have time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Fran, for marrying multiple concepts beyond just science in the fight for the preservation of wolves and definitely left us with a lot to think about. I've been getting, we've been getting a lot of questions in the chat about if this presentation is going to be available. Um, as well as some resources because you've given us so much um, and to let you all know there will be um, all of these presentations will be recorded and put on our YouTube for your review and rewatch. Um, so there are some really wonderful questions Dr. Santiago Avila and I would love to ask you some of them. Um, the first one is from um, Hannah Thompson Garner. If we wanted to reform or introduce ethics promoting individual sentience and interspecies justice into conservation management programs already in place, are there templates or action plans on how to do so already drafted that we can refer to during our conversations with policymakers? Template or action plans, are, that's a really good question. There are some templates for this and there are some ways, some frameworks uh, to get these conversations started, right? Because the hard part, it's always getting folks to actually, you know, get some buying from folks to have these conversations in the first place because ethics is such a, an intimate uh, discussion always. Um, so some frameworks that have been provided, uh, one of them from um, um, philo environmental philosopher and ethicist uh, William Lynn is uh, providing, um, and I can, you know, if you can shoot me an email after this, I can get you the references, anyone that needs it, but he provides a framework and he's uh, 
implemented this work framework within uh, the barred owl and spotted owl issues that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working with in the Pacific Northwest. And it's basically um, a, a training workshops to get folks to first be aware and identify what values they actually hold, you know, and that's the initial part of the conversation is, all, is really consciously thinking about these things internally before even having the discussion to see where you stand in relation to other beings, to other animals, and where that relativism and that uh, confusion, that muddling of thought is. So there's some frameworks there that are guided by workshops that allow folks to, first of all, be safe in the space that these conversations are going to take place. So there are safe harbor agreements that allow for individuals to really establish trust with each other, even though they may hold different perspectives. So that allows for uh, honesty in these discussions and finding common ground, fusing, fusing horizons of understanding between what we consider and what we value. Um, and um, there are other, um, uh, that's one, so that's one uh, uh, framework starting with those methods. There are others that have been proposed, but that have yet to make it to wildlife in general, but that you see in other policy issues, like for example, reviews of the ethical implications of certain actions, not only for humans, but for other animals, is something that you might see, you know, with research in the medical science for humans, right? And that's why we have so many uh, in bioethics, so many principles that protect subjects that came through an ethical examination of what we were doing to other humans and their implications, which, which could be established within wildlife management and any other um, activity that relates to animal and animal interventions, but that has yet to be done because of these reigning paradigms. Right? So um, I would say initially, uh, the idea is to get folks comfortable enough to have these conversations. And uh, one underutilized tool there, I think, uh, for a lot of us is kindness. And it's compassion and it's understanding that, you know, none of us can know everything. We both, we all come from different, you know, uh, upbringing, situational context that make us who we are. And so for to establish common ground and make some progress in considering others, we need to start by being true to ourselves, making clarifying what our values are and establishing trust with others. So I think that's step one to then proceed with further dismantling these ideas. Thank you for that, Fran. And if I can ask, okay. how has your research been utilized to this day and what do you see as the obstacles regarding integration of some of these metaphysical aspects of non-human community members into wildlife management? Great question. Um, I don't see, <laughs> that's a great question because we, as I mentioned, we were just reviewing all these plans uh, as part of my work with uh, Paya Coyote and the Rewilding Institute and all these regulations. And it's funny because these plans somehow managed to um, um, include all the research that my research challenges, but not mine. Somehow that got lost in the ether despite the, the relevancy and the timeliness of my research. Um, so I don't see yet any signal that this research is being considered by state or federal agencies. In fact, most of our comments noted that uh, even the education that these agencies are going to provide and the expertise that they're saying they, they have scientifically is untrustworthy if they're cherry picking the signs that they, they include in those management plans. And again, you know, I finished my PhD in 2019. Like this is just like research that's been coming out in, in the last five years. So there's no excuse to not include it even when you know they include research that covers the same time period. So again, noting that the bias here goes beyond, well beyond focus on what science is included. The question is why isn't that science being included in those plans, let alone uh, um, studies like the one I did for the ethical evaluation of Wisconsin's wolf policies, which you're never gonna see uh, anywhere, right? Despite the implications for even federal agencies, because we study the uh, US Fish and Wildlife regulations as well, and the regulations that follow uh, in the mission and values of wildlife services, the um, USDA agency. So very little to say there about 
how these are going to be uh, included there. But it is encouraging that, you know, organizations and we're making those available to organizations. We're going through advocates and uh, through litigation to actually get, try to get that science in there. But, you know, I'll note again that, you know, it is important to get that science in there, as important as it is to get that science in there. That's only going to happen if we change the perspective of wildlife management. So that kind of leads into this next question. So you talk about the paradigm of conservation. The North American model of conservation was made with human sovereignty at the forefront. In your opinion, what is the largest Jenga piece that needs to be removed to create room for ethical conservation from dominion to cohabitation? The largest Jenga piece, Jenga piece that needs to be removed from dominion to cohabitation. Um, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I, you know, in a way, I like the um, part of the reason why I utilize, for example, Matthew Clark's framing of anthropocentrism and why I utilize the work of uh, Claire Jean Kim and uh, AFCO, I mentioned as well, and all these um, sort of like more recent, you know, uh, um, feminist uh, scholars and uh, critical study scholars is because they're able to sort of decenter the human in a way that also makes it relevant to other humans. You know, they are able to establish uh, a good case for how these oppressions that we've been fighting within our species and these oppressions that we see towards animals are all symptoms of the same type of dismissal, of disrespect of beings who are just different, who are just different, but that they have the same fundamental claims to life and well-being. And so if we can make that connection and decenter ourselves and see ourselves as just other beings within a community of beings that are just searching for the same thing, that is the biggest Jenga piece. So I think, you know, especially, you know, the biggest Jenga piece would be the metaphysics. It would be the minute because it's inevitable that it is the metaphysics, right? And, and that is so hard for not only conservationists to understand, but a lot of them to get a handle of and to actually begin discussing because it's not something that, for example, they get any training on, even exposure on within their training. And that's a big, big gap in uh, expertise right there because it hinders your ability to actually know where you stand in these issues and in the world, in the universe in general, you know, like metaphysics, who you are, your identity, your values, just colors the world and how you behave towards everything. So to the extent that conservationists are trained like technocrats, like scientists and empiricists, and they lose all that other side, it's like you training a bunch of doctors without any medical ethics at all. Right. And again, let's note that, you know, Michael Soule also in the What is Conservation Biology article noted that this is conservation is a clinical field. So to the extent that you compare it with clinical medicine, you're just like, whoa, there's a lot of ethical training, you know, that's necessary here that it's been absolutely dismissed as well. And a lot of the reasons is because, again, this uh, instrumental anthropocentric paradigm that's training. That's so interesting because it's <laughs> where what you were saying is we're becoming so infused with science that the ethics is kind of fading away when that's what's going to save us. There's been a lot of interest about how do we change politicians' mind or how do we work across the aisle um, for the benefit of wolves to, to think about their intrinsic value to the ecosystem and not just their, their resource, right? Um, so you speak a lot to that, and we thank you so much for that, Dr. San, uh, Francisco. This has been amazing, and I want to give enough time for the next speaker. Um, but for the rest of everyone in the presentation, um, this will be available in a couple of weeks for you to review. Um, and Fran, do you have any last minute words or do you do you have any last minute thoughts that you want to just get out there for everyone who's here and um, has really enjoyed your presentation? Yeah, I think my, my you know, parting thought would be to highlight to um, be intersectional. Um, yeah. These issues are uh, the, the individuals that advocate for oppressing others are intersectional as well. 
So being intersectional is the only way out of this. And that intersectionality can't leave animals behind. Animals are also, and animal oppression is also a social justice issue. It's not only an environmental or ecological issue. So to the extent that we understand that, we can actually start being you know, actually intersectional and addressing conflicts that harm beings across the board. Thank you so much for that.